Hello and welcome back to the Hasbro Gen YouTube channel. It is Harry here, and today it is time for the second part of the P segment of the Football Alphabet series, where, as we normally do, we take a look at the best players whose names or surnames begin with the letter P. If you've missed any of the episodes thus far, the playlist link is down in the description. And whilst you're there, please do hit the like button and hit that subscribe button if you've not done so already. And without any further ado, let's have a look at my Hall of Fame of the best players whose surnames begin with the letter P. Number one, Pele. To some, he's a fraud who will try to claim as many goals as possible for the sake of keeping his records intact, but to others, he is the greatest player of all time and someone who revolutionized the popularity of the sport on a global scale. And that man's name, of course, is Pele. Born in 1940 as Edson Alain Testo Nascimento, he was given the nickname Pele whilst at school, and whilst he originally hated it, the name gradually began to stick, and it was under this alias slash nickname that he made his debut for Santos in 1956 at the age of just 15. By the end of the next season, still aged only 16, he would end up as the top scorer in the Brazilian Regional League, backing that up with a quite frankly laughable 58 goals during the 1958 season. Although unknown globally owing to the lack of footage coming out of Brazil, the 1958 World Cup would give the 17-year-old a chance to showcase his skills on the biggest stage of them all, and he didn't disappoint. He scored 6 in the knockout stages after being injured throughout most of the group stages, including a hat-trick in the semi-finals against France and 2 in the final against Sweden, becoming the youngest player to ever score in a World Cup final and the last teenager to do so until Kylian Mbappe netted for France against Croatia just 3 years ago. Those were six of his 77 goals that he scored for the Salasau, still a national record to this day, winning two more World Cups along the way, including in 1970, where he scored four goals and recorded seven assists as part of arguably the World Cup's greatest ever side. It is speculated that Pele scored 1,281 goals in 1,363 games, including friendlies, although many have said that those friendlies don't count because they were against lesser opponents. In reality, if you're going to use an argument, it should actually be as competitive goals that are called into question, since many of them came against lesser, but still not awful, opponents, whereas many of his friendly goals would come during tours across Europe as the star attraction with Santos, as they faced teams of the calibre of AC Milan, Benfica and Real Madrid on a regular basis. A quick, agile, clinical and explosive forward who was unplayable at almost all times unless you hacked him down unfairly, Pele guided Santos to six Brazilian Serie A's and two Copa Libertadores titles during his 18-year spell there, and although he retired in 1974, he reversed his decision to spend two years in America with the New York Cosmos, before retiring for good in 1977. Ever since then, he has been Brazil's sports minister as well as a UNESCO Goodwill ambassador, and in 2000, he was awarded the FIFA Player of the Century Award alongside Diego Maradona. Number 2. Michel Platini Regrettably, my next inclusion is a player who has seen his reputation tarnished over the last few years as a result of his complicity in FIFA's multiple corruption scandals during the last couple of decades, but make no mistake about it, Michel Platini was one of the best players of his day, and he rightfully goes down as one of the greatest in his position, which was a number 10. Born in 1955, he started his career out at Nancy, but when he made it onto the bench at age 17 for the first time, a fight amongst the spectators led to him being spat on and being hit by multiple objects, and it took a couple of seasons for him to acclimatise to the world of professional football. In 1974-75 though, he was Nancy's star man as they won promotion back to the Ligue 1 after relegation the season prior, and over the next four seasons, he would hit 77 goals in 124 games in his attacking midfield role. An outstanding technician who had incredible close control, passing range, vision and set-piece ability, Platini was rather languid but more than made up for that with his ability on the ball, and upon joining Saint-Étienne in 1979, he would win his first league title within two years, scoring 82 in 145 for Liver. His big money move finally came with a transfer to Juventus in 1982, where he continued his sparkling form, becoming the creative linchpin in the Juventus midfield and winning everything on offer to him, including the European Cup in 1985, albeit in a game marred by the Heisel disaster. His coup de grace came during the 1984 European Championships, as he would score 9 goals in just 5 games to guide France to their first ever major international honours, and those 9 goals make him the joint top goalscorer in Euro's history alongside Cristiano Ronaldo, although CR7 hit them across 4 tournaments compared to Platini's 1. He would win 3 consecutive Ballon d'Ors between 1983 and 1985 at a time when doing that just wasn't normal, but in 1987, at the age of just 31, he retired, becoming the French national team manager within a year and remaining so until 1992. 
He would become UEFA president in 2007, but in 2015, after being caught up in FIFA's 17 millionth corruption scandal, he was banned from any kind of involvement in football until 2023. A sad mark on the legacy of a truly remarkable player. Number 3. Ferenc Puskas Nicknamed the Galloping Major for his pace, cannon of a left foot, strength and bulky frame, Ferenc Puskas was arguably the star of the Magical Magyars team of the 1950s and certainly the one who attracted the most attention overseas for his performances within the team. Born in 1927, he started out his career at Kishpest, who would later be taken over by the army during the communist era and changed their name to Budapest Honved, but he was already earmarked as a star from a young age, and he didn't disappoint, scoring 358 goals in 350 games for the club, including a quite frankly ridiculous 50 in 31 during the 1947-48 season, and winning 5 league titles along the way. As part of the Magical Magyars, he was primarily a striker or an outside forward, with his runs from deep and powerful shots causing headaches for goalkeepers and defences alike. He was certainly big-headed and well aware of his immense quality, making him difficult to get along with on some occasions, but he frequently stood up to the Communist Party and their rulings, something which other Hungarian players at the time were scared to do, given what may have happened to them. Unfortunately, during the 1954 World Cup, he was injured in their group game against West Germany, and as he was rushed back for the final against the same opponents, he didn't have the required impact as Hungary lost 3-2, although he did score the opening goal, as well as seeing what would have been the potential equaliser at the end of the game disallowed, perhaps unfairly, for offside. In 1956, after the Hungarian uprising, he fled the country, settling in Spain after Honved had played Athletic Bilbao in the European Cup, but as a result of his actions, he was banned from playing by FIFA for two years. His ballooning weight didn't put off Real Madrid upon the ban's expiration, and he hit new heights with Los Blancos, scoring 242 goals in 262 games in all competitions, dovetailing brilliantly with the likes of Paco Gento, Alfredo Di Stefano and Hector Real, winning three European Cups and five La Ligas with the club. He retired in 1966, becoming a nomadic coach whose longest stint at a club was four years with Panathinaikos in Greece, ending his football career by managing the Hungarian national team in 1993, 12 years after returning to the country for the first time since he fled it in 1956. Number 4. Andrea Pirlo it is actually a cardinal sin to dislike Andrea Pirlo, not only for his intellect, good looks and suave personality, but for his technique, style of play and intelligence on the football pitch. Born in 1979, he started out his career at Brescia before moving to Inter Milan in 1998, although they didn't really rate him all that much, only giving him 40 games across three seasons and sending him out on loan twice, and in 2001, they were only too happy to let him go into their stadium share as AC Milan for around 17 million euros. What a mistake that proved to be. He would go on to spend a further 10 years at the San Siro with the Rossoneri, winning everything on offer to him on multiple occasions, including the Champions League twice, as he became the key cog in Milan's creative output from deep, as well as for Italy, with whom he won a World Cup in 2006 as part of his 116 caps won for the Azzurri. Pirlo notoriously had a deep dislike for both running and training, but one thing that he had that set him apart from the rest was his ability to scan the pitch in a split second and spot where a pass could be sent a few seconds before the pass needed to be made. His agility on the ball made it difficult for defenders to dispossess him, and his laser-like vision was almost impossible to counteract when the vineyard owner was in full flight. An attacker's dream of a player and a set-piece specialist, Pirlo was simply a genius on the pitch, but in 2010-11, Milan didn't see it that way anymore and allowed him to depart on a free to Juventus after winning the league that season. Once again, what a mistake that proved to be. Upon his arrival, Gianluigi Buffon called it the transfer of the century and he didn't let them down as he helped Juventus to win their first league title without Calciopoli since 2003 as well as all of the following three titles on offer, with his wizardry on the ball providing the impetus for Juventus to go on and establish themselves as the dominant force in the Italian game. He departed on a free again in 2015, this time to New York City FC and after two seasons lighting up the MLS, he retired in 2017. Unsurprisingly, he became a coach, but he was thrust into the top job at Juventus a bit quicker than he might have anticipated after Maurizio Sarri's sacking last summer, especially since he'd only been appointed as an under-23 manager the previous week, and he's under pressure as a result of their failings in Serie A to challenge for the league title, as well as their shock defeat to Porto in the round of 16 of the Champions League. No matter, for a man whose autobiography title is I Think Therefore I Play, I'm sure he'll succeed as a manager at some point. It may just take a little bit of time. Number 5. Adolfo Pedernera 
A famed part of River Plate's La Maquina side of the 1940s, Adolfo Padanella was one of the famous front five who tore Argentinian football to shreds with style and panache, primarily playing as a powerful and rapid outside forward. Born in 1918, he grew up supporting another one of Argentina's grandes in the form of Racing Club, although he would join the academy of River Plate at the age of just 14, following in the footsteps of his father, and he made his senior debut for them two years later. He would become the conductor of the side, instigating the team's attacks and supplying the runners with precise through balls, and his nickname was Adolfo Divino, which I don't think I need to translate, owing to his pivotal role. He won five Primera División titles with Los Millonarios between 1935 and 1946, going at just under a goal every other game in the league, but undoubtedly assisting a whole lot more, as well as lifting two Copas America with Argentina in 1941 and 1946. However, in 1949, a strike over pay in Argentina led to many players defecting to Colombia, and Pedernera, who by this point was playing for Huracan, was at the forefront of that movement, as the chairman of Millonarios sent their manager, Carlos Aldave, over to Argentina to sign him, and after Pedernera named his price, which was extortionate for the time, at $200 per month and a $5,000 sign-on fee, the chairman simply said, bring him. And so they did, with 15,000 people turning up to his inauguration ceremony alone, and he didn't disappoint, not only winning four league titles in five seasons with them, the last two as player manager, but also bringing over the likes of Nestor Rossi and Alfredo Di Stefano to strengthen the team even further. He retired in 1955 and became a manager, managing a staggering 13 clubs or nations within 27 years, including spending two spells with six of them, but of course, it's his feats as a player which warrants his inclusion in this video. That just about wraps up today's video on the best players whose surnames begin with the letter P. If you enjoyed this video, then of course hit the like button and hit that subscribe button. You can ring the little notification bell to get notified whenever I upload a video straight away. And of course, if you've missed any of the Football Alphabet episodes as far, as I said at the start, there is a playlist link in the description for you to check them all out. And they're all nicely ordered for you backwards, because that's how I'm running this series for some reason. But thank you very much for watching in any case, and until next time, I'll see you then.